All right, I'm going to finish up this section. It's about 10 pages, and uh, that'll get us to around page 27 of 41. Then tomorrow when we start, I'll finish this chapter, and we'll also get into the next chapter. All right? It'd be great if we could, between today and tomorrow, finish, then you'd have a lot of lap time. But I want, us, I want to give you some lap time, at least an hour today, probably closer to an hour and a half. All right? And the same tomorrow. All right. So section 2.2, which starts on page 17, is on the activity life cycle. If you look on the screen, please, all right, it says about the activity life cycle, the best place to go for information on the activity life cycle is developer.android.com. If you go out to there and you go to their guide, there's a whole big, real long section on it. So if you want to learn more, and this right here give me that for that the image in the detail. there we go this is kind of the quintessential picture right here i mean there's a lot of junk going on there but they kind of show you everything that can possibly happen in an app during the life cycle right there so they mention here in this section you learn about the activity life cycle the callback events that implement, you can implement to perform tasks in each stage of the life cycle. One thing I did not do a good enough job of, and as far as, I mean, Grace, you could probably say whether or not Evan did this, but we talked about JavaScript, and we did a lot of work with JavaScript. One thing we did not spend a lot of time on in JavaScript and mainly in jQuery, we're talking about callback functions. And with a callback function, what that says is after your, your function that you called has completed its operation, it can send information back or it can call, you know, whatever. And that's what they're talking about right here. So it says you learn about the callback events you can implement to perform tasks during each stage of the life cycle. Now, I would be amazed in a great way if when when you do your presentations at the end of the semester that you could handle everything that could possibly happen with your app but the chances are there's going to be something that could happen that you just never counted on happening all right just some weird thing that was maybe a one in a thousand occurrence give you an example it's not with an app but years ago my my older brother worked at an air filter corporation and they used this software they got with his operating system somebody else invented it was called the PIC operating system and they they created this order entry system for them okay one day one of the people working there it wasn't him he says at least but one of the people working there went up to grab a uh, one of the manuals and when they did it fell right on top of the keyboard Oh, no big deal, right? The, the program was still running, etc. What they didn't realize is somebody put some weird key combination. They removed two of their customers. All right? And nothing like that had ever happened before. Then they were wondering why they weren't getting anything back. One of them was, I guess, a regular customer, and they looked in the database, and they weren't there anymore. All right? So they had to go find, they, they backed up their stuff every day, so they were lucky they were able to bring it back again. But the point is, nobody planned on anything like that happening. All right. So as it says, the activity life cycle is the set of activities or the set of states that your app can be in during its life. And they give some examples. When you start, when you go into the main activity, as it says, when you start, the main activity is called via an intent. It comes into the foreground and it receives the focus. If you start another activity, that new activity is created and the main activity must be stopped. If you're done with that second activity and you want to go back to the first, the first activity will resume, the second activity stops, and it's no longer needed. Typically, it's destroyed. All right, And that's the kind of stuff that they're talking about here. And if that doesn't make sense, they show it to you pictorially on page 18 on the top of the next page all right again 
if we did have written tests, this would be the kind of stuff you'd be getting on. You know, what happens during this stage? What happens during this stage, etc. All right. So as mentioned here on the bottom of page 18, when an activity transitions in and out of different states, I already showed you, talked to you about some of them. All right, You're, you've got an app going, whatever the app is, it doesn't matter. The phone rings. That activity, or that, that app rather, goes into the on pause state. You hang up the phone. It goes back in typically, I think, into the resume state. All right, and that's the kind of stuff that they're talking about here. It says, keep in mind that the life cycle states are the states for an individual activity, not necessarily for the entire app. You may want it, you may want your app to act differently if you are in one part of the app as opposed to being in another part of the app. So here, and again, kind of a complex picture here on page 19. But as it says, it shows each of the activity states and the callback methods that occur. So the state is resumed. If you go to start and you want to, you know, you're paused and you want to come back again, all right, you have to call on resume. So they're showing these are the states, all right, in the colored bubbles. And what you see kind of in the grayish text, those are the associated actual states themselves where you can put in code. So that's the callback methods, all right? It says, depending on the complexity of your activity, you probably don't need to implement something everywhere. But it says it's important that you understand each one of those because depending on what your app is and what it does, it might be important in one or more of those activities to actually put code, all right? So, activity created and on create. You already know what on create is. If you wanted to know more than your instructor has given you about bundle, saved instances, etc., all right, you know what bundle is now? We already know. You've already used a bundle. And where it says save instances, that again is an example. If I go, excuse me, and I, I'm, I'm working on an app and I go from one orientation to another. So I'm in portrait orientation and I turn my tablet. So now I want to be able to see it from a different angle. So now I'm in landscape. All right. The system has to save all of my settings and it saves them inside of that bundle. And that saved instant state is kind of like a picture that it takes of all my settings. All right. Now notice... The activity enters the create state when it started for the first time. When it's first created, it calls on create to initialize. Anything that needs a single initialization at the beginning should be initialized in on create. All right. It says the on create is the only required callback you must implement in your activity class. In other words, you need it. And you're typically going to want to put some code in it. This is the kind of stuff that you see in it. So again, they explain in here everything that's happening. All right. It'll make more sense if you go and give it a read yourselves. I don't want to read to you any more than you probably want to hear me read to you. All right. Running the on resume method. It says the activity is in the resume state when it's initialized, visible on screen, and ready to use. It's resume. You can resume. You're ready to use it. They say there it's also known as the run state. All right? Because that's when you're actually able to interact with it. On the bottom of the page here, they mention. You typically only implement on resume as a counterpart to on pause. And I already mentioned typically when you'd want to pause. Phone rings. Somehow you stop using one app and start using another one. Notice the activity remains in the resume state as long as it's in the foreground. All right, so as long as it's available to you. And actually, one of the things 
that Android has done over the years is it's made it harder when you're programming this stuff because you can have split windows and the like. And sometimes that can, you know, you got to really watch what you're doing. All right. It says the pause, which is next here on page 21, can occur for a variety of reasons. The activity goes into the background, but it hasn't yet been stopped. It's only partially visible on a screen, or again, as I just mentioned, in a multi-window or a split screen, the activity is displayed on screen, but some other activity has the focus. One thing you shouldn't do if you're in pause, and some people do this, I think they mentioned it in here, don't use it for anything that's CPU intensive. For instance, if you're in a pause state, oh, that's the time I'm going to write back to my database. Don't do that. All right, it's a, it's a good way to screw the app up. All right, typically you don't, it's not going to be in pause for a very long time. Activity stopped, the on stop method. What that means if it's stopped, you didn't get rid of it. That's the next one that's right there on the screen. That's the destroy. But if it's stopped, literally, you're giving up control right now. It's no longer visible on the screen. So again, as I mentioned, the phone rings. All right. Or maybe and maybe it's a video, you know, a video type of call. So it rings, you see the person's picture, boom, you click on it, you start talking. All right, your app, your app that was running is probably going to go into stop mode then. All right? What happens is if you've got a lot of stuff running, if you've got a lot of different apps running, okay, you may have noticed this, you may not have noticed this. Right now, this, this laptop that I have, it acts a lot like a phone. What do I mean? I mean the battery kind of sucks on this right now. All right? And I don't know about your phone. Mine's an older phone. This battery is not good. I've had it replaced once. It probably could be replaced again. The reason I'm mentioning this to you is sometimes what the system will do is it'll queue up all of the, all the apps that you have running. But if you've got too many running, it'll start looking and say, well, which one has been there the longest? And it'll get rid of it. And it'll call the on destroy method itself. All right. Why? Because, again, it's taking up too much juice. It's slowing down the system too much because you have too many applications currently open. Now, you can basically, you could, it says when an activity is destroyed, it is shut down completely. All right. And it says it can happen for several reasons. You can read those. Okay. Notice we just called finish. Right? That manually set it down, shut it down. All right? The user goes back to another activity. The third one is the one I mentioned. The device is low in memory or bad, you know, low in battery. You use on destroy to fully clean up after your activity. So on destroy is sort of like when we, if you remember, when we went in and talked try catch, and we mentioned there was a finally block that you could use in there for house cleaning operations. Closing files, closing database connections, that's kind of what happens in OnDestroy. You clean up everything that's still open. Now, even if you've destroyed it, some of that information, most of it, is still available. Why? Look on the screen. In case you call on restart. Oh, I didn't mean to shut that one, so you bring it back up again. All right? Normally, it'll still have your settings and everything in there still in there all right notice it says it's a transient state that only occurs if a stopped activity is started again all right and it has to be pretty quick too I don't know if there's a timing thing with it but you know if you do it the next day or something like that of course that's not going to happen all right configuration changes I'm on page 23 and activity state it says configuration changes occur on the device in runtime and can invalidate the current layout or other resources. One thing that we are going to do, I'm not sure when, it's when I finish it, is I have not done anything in here yet talking to you about layouts. I've been looking online for different things on layouts. By and large, the things I've found, I've watched a bunch of videos, they're not very good. 
but we are going to create some kind of an activity within the next week. All right, and I'll probably make it where you got to hand it in because that's the only way people seem to really listen and get into it. Where we will do, we will take something with probably with a constraint layout and do some stuff we haven't done yet. So you can see the different things that can be done with a constraint layout. There's other kinds of layouts. You may have noticed this, you may not have. You know, maybe I even showed you. I don't know, but if you look up on the screen here, if I go into my activity main and I go in, if you remember up here, we've got this. All right, if I type in layout and I hit enter, all right, there's a constraint layout, there's a linear layout, both in horizontal and vertical, there's a frame layout, there's a table layout, there's a tab layout, there's a grid layout, there's a relative layout. And they actually used to have more than this. There used to be a card layout, there was an absolute layout, I don't remember what else. All right, when an activity is destroyed and recreated, it says there are implications for the runtime state of the activity. Notice as it says, some, some information will automatically be saved by default. All right, and it'll try to work with that. So in other words, if you shut something down, oops, I didn't mean to, it's typically going to depend upon how much time between when you shut it down and when you try to bring it back up as far as how much stuff it can save. All right. It says to save information to the instant state bundle, you use the on save instant state callback. We already saw that at the beginning of this section. It says this is not a lifecycle callback method, but it's called whenever the user leaves an activity. All right. And again, what do you have to do? It's like I mentioned before. Tip the, where that becomes the most important is if I decide I want to change orientation on my machine and I'm playing a game, then what's good, what it's going to do if I go from portrait to landscape or vice versa, it'll save the high score, my score, what level I'm on, etc. It'll save that stuff, and that's what they're talking about here. All right. <clears throat> And they go into how it's restored. That's pretty much it. Again, if you look up on the screen here, if you want more information, you can go look at any of that stuff. What we'll do tomorrow, if you look, please, one more time on the screen here. This is the end of the chapter. It's the last 15 or so pages. It's on implicit intents. And I know a lot of this stuff is really dry. That's why tomorrow when we go through this, I'll try to come up with some kind of a program that we can do so you can see it as opposed to just talking about it. So we'll go over this the last 14, 15 pages. Then we'll go into chapter three, which again, as it says, is on the debugger. All right, so much of that stuff you've gone over, but you've gone over it and how it's used in uh, Visual Studio. This is how to do similar types of things in Android Studio. So we'll do that. So the rest of the period today, Everybody realizes, right, you've got those two programs that I asked you to do that are due Friday. Is there anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about? Or if you lost, you know, the paper or whatever, let me know. I'll run you off another copy. All right, but I've got it in here someplace. Let's see. I think this is it. The miles per gallon one that's right here. All right. Yeah, maybe we did this one already. I don't remember. I'll, I'll find it. How's that? <clears throat> 